I'm Mike Maloney, and welcome to the CSRM Tuesday Talk, a monthly roundtable discussion covering a range of relevant topics in ministry and current events. Let's join Dr. Greg Linville, Dan Stoffer, and Greg English as we hear from international experts in the fields of sports, recreation, and fitness ministry. Welcome again to another CSRM Tuesday Talk, and uh, today we are talking about evangelistic disciple-making. What happens a lot of times in our sports ministries and even in our churches is we tend to separate out evangelism and discipleship. Uh, They don't always work together. A lot of times we're frustrated at the lack of discipleship in general in our churches and our sports ministries. And sometimes we get frustrated the fact that we're not reaching people. And if we are reaching people, we're not growing them. And so I'm excited today to be joined by uh, my co-host here today, Andrew Fouts. Andrew, why don't you uh, give us a, a good word here today? Hey, everybody. I just keep jumping uh, jumping seats here. I've been in every seat over the past four four months. So glad glad to be on for this one. I'm excited to hear uh hear the experts, literal experts in this case, not even just supposed experts, but definitely experts with Greg and Roger and Eric here as far as what what we got here with evangelistic disciple making. So, Yeah, it's an important conversation. And uh, Andrew, myself, we are excited to to drive this conversation, but uh, let's introduce our conversationalists here today. And uh, Dr. Greg Linville, we'll start with you because I see you first on the screen. Tell us a little bit about who you are, where you're located, And then we'll move on to the other conversationalists. Great to be with everybody, and particularly with this conversation. And uh, I've been with uh, CSRM for as long as CSRM has existed, except for one year. Uh, There was one year I wasn't involved in all, and currently serve as the director of resource development. So yes, I can send anybody a pledge card that wants to donate, but... The development part of this, the research, the uh, resource development, it has more to do with the resources that we're developing for other people. So I oversee our publishing house. We've got about a dozen titles out, and we're working on three others that I'm excited about right now. And then overseeing our recording studio and the Tuesday Talks as part of that, and our podcast and our training event. Uh, and also helping with the reach gathering and helping with all the track teams and seminars and, and all that goes on there. And I am, I have five grandchildren that they told me about. Um, so there's, maybe there's more and, and, and uh, we don't know it yet, but uh, yeah, that's been a, that's been a blessing in, in this time of life as well. So happily married, we just, just celebrated 39, uh, 39th anniversary. And we've had 36 good years of marriage. <laughs> so fortunately, it wasn't three years in a row, but a day here and a, and a week there. And of course, that was all my fault those three years. So, But there we are. There, there you have it. We appreciate you. And uh, 39 years is a, an awesome milestone. I know next year will be a very big one. And so uh, we're, we're thankful that you're with us yet again, Greg. Thank you, thank you for your longevity in ministry. We're excited for what you're going to contribute here today. Uh, next, we're going to move on. Uh, Eric Kitchen. And uh, Eric is a part of my regional roundtable uh, with CSRM. And I uh, met Eric maybe about a year ago or so. Uh, they've got some interesting things going on uh, with their church. And um, just some really cool stuff they're going to talk about here. He's going to talk about here today, especially about metrics and our topic of conversation. So, Eric, tell us where you're located. Tell us about your church. Tell us about your role in ministry as well. I think you're on mute there, Eric. There we go. Uh, technology. Um, my name is Eric Kitchen, and I'm in the Columbus, Ohio area in a little town called Canal Winchester. And um, I serve as one of the pastors or elders at our church and I've been here uh, since 1999. So about, what's that, about 22 years. 
I've got lots of different roles on staff from youth and student ministries to some things with sports ministry um, as well. And I've been um, much a part of um, figuring out um, this discipleship journey for us. And I'm excited of uh, what, what God is doing. So I'm blessed to have uh, a wife of a 25 years this year we celebrated. And as far as I know, um, all 25 have been good. <laughs> and uh, I've got three kids, um, 20, uh, 14, and 11. So I'm grateful to be here today. Awesome. And it's New Life Church, correct? New Life Church, yes. All right. Uh, our next uh, conversationalist today, many of you probably have heard of him or maybe even know him, uh, a longtime veteran in sports ministry, and uh, that's Roger Oswald. And Roger, tell us a little bit about yourself, your ministry, and where you're located. Thanks, Dan. Uh, it is a pleasure to be with you gentlemen this morning and all who may be online. Uh, I am located in Sacramento, California, and uh, my wife and I just celebrated our 58th anniversary. So you guys are just kids. Uh, blessed to have five grandchildren. Uh, my role in ministry has almost always been through sports and recreation. Started in ministry as a sports minister at a church when they didn't know what the term meant. And uh, had the pleasure of uh, being a part of seeing ISC born and seeing CSRM born and then had my own ministry for 21 years called Church Sports International. Uh, currently uh, staff emeritus with CSRM and love staying connected. Uh, it's interesting. Um, most of my 21 years with CSI was an international ministry and in most countries, they do not have the word retirement in their vocabulary. Those people work until they die, and they think you do too. And so I, I've had the privilege of continuing to stay involved with the people we've trained over the years. And uh, many of your resources, um, you know, you are that, that pioneer in, in sports ministry, uh, and you have a lot to say about things, and there's a lot of... Um, great resources that can be found on, on our CSRM website. And so we just want to encourage you to check that out, uh, utilize a lot of Roger's knowledge, his expertise. Uh, those resources are made available for you there. So uh, we just revamped our website. Uh, so if you haven't checked it out recently, please do so. And uh, be sure to, to look out for some of Roger's resources there as well. All right, Roger, I'm going to start with you, and then we're going to just go in the reverse order of what we just did for our introductions. But when we talk about evangelistic uh, disciple making, the reason why that's a, a key phrase and what we try to uh, coach with CSRM as we work with sports ministers, as we work with churches, is because a lot of times churches tend to separate both of those key components to the Great Commission. You know, Jesus told us to go and to make disciples. So we love evangelism. We love discipleship. And a lot of times through our programs, through our efforts, through our sports ministries, we tend to separate those two. And so I want to start off with the question, why? Why do we separate evangelism and discipleship? And why should we try to work them both together? So Roger, let's start with you and your expertise. Why does the church struggle with this? Why, why the separation? Why do sports ministers struggle with this? Love to hear your thoughts on that. I think one of the primary reasons, Dan, is because the church increasingly is becoming a holy huddle, uh, you know, a, a gathering of the frozen chosen, and they don't have as a mindset that seeing people one to Christ and grown in their faith go together hand in hand. I remember being in Wolfboro, New Hampshire one time, and we would drove by this church and out in front was their uh, a bulletin board. And, and it had the name of the church and it said, knowing Christ and making him known. And I thought that captures it. You know, we need to make Christ known, but in addition, we need to know him. Jesus in, seven, in uh, John 17, 3 said, now this is life eternal that you might know him, the only true God in Christ Jesus whom he has sent. And the problem is we've taken something very culturally positive, sports, 
that builds a bridge to the lost in our community, but we've only seen it as a means to interest people in the gospel or interest them in our church and fail to see the dual responsibility of winning them and then growing them. Yeah, I think, I think where a lot of people get stuck is they don't, they don't even have a phrase like that. You know, there's, there's no conversation, no phrase about getting people to know God and then grow in, in God. Uh, and so, you know, we don't have this, this strategy for, hey, when, when you come to Christ, well, you're justified. Okay, and then you spend the rest of your journey with Christ growing or being sanctified. And so there's no overall process there. And I think you're absolutely right. I think it's it's a lack of planning. It's a lack of strategy. And I think that's why we're having this conversation here. So I appreciate your thoughts there. Eric, uh, tell us why you think sports ministries, why churches tend to separate those two key components to the Great Commission. Yeah, I think there's... Um it seems as though I think churches have had this idea that we're supposed to compartmentalize everything and we're supposed to have separate ministries for everything. And uh, we're supposed to have separate staff for everything. And therefore we need to um, separate these things and they're not to be connected really at all. Um, So for us, um, we have uh, grabbed a hold of the term disciple making and both evangelism and discipleship would be a part of disciple making. Uh, we would still use the term discipleship um, to um, be just a, a deeper relationship with the Lord using spiritual disciplines and those types of things. But when it comes to disciple making, we've made that um, one process that encompasses um, both of both of those things. And we think about the role of the church, you know, and the mission of the church to go and to make disciples, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded. Um, clearly, um, evangelism and um, uh, much like Roger said, uh, the making him known and knowing him are clearly a part of that discipleship process. So that's that's kind of where we are with it as a church. Yeah, we love that term disciple making. Um, you know, it's something that just makes a lot of sense. It's something that's ongoing. It's not a one time thing, right? Uh, it takes effort. It takes strategy. And uh, really uh, interested to to hear more about what you guys are doing, Eric, as we continue with the conversation. But speaking of disciple making, uh, we know uh, Dr. Greg Linville has a lot to say on this subject, but. Uh, Greg, tell us why, in your experience, uh, both as a local church sports minister and your role with CSRM as you coach sports ministers and churches, why, why does the church struggle with, with this whole process? Why, why do we tend to do one or the other, not both? In your opinion, uh, why, why is this happening? Well, why do we do discipleship side of it and not evangelism? typically because we don't know anybody who's not a believer, that holy huddle that Roger talked about. And so it's easier for some people to say, I'm just discipling people, I'm making disciples. And they really don't want to do what they need to do to to reach those that are far from Jesus and his church. And then the evangelists, uh, the person who just is out there, they're going, they're blowing, but they find it hard to stay with somebody and they they come at it and say, I just have to get somebody to raise their hand today and then I'm off for the next person. And so that's one of the re- reasons why CSRM uses this phrase of evangelistic disciple making, because there needs to be a focus on the going, but also on the disciple making part of it. And if I could, if I could start with this, that it really is that we have at best only done part of the Great Commission. Whenever you hear about the Great Commission, Matthew 28, the last couple of verses, we get the go part. We might even get the go into all the world part, but we that's where we leave it. But the Great Commission didn't stop with go or go into all the world. It said go and all the world, make disciples. Okay, how do we do that? Baptizing them. And we just conveniently forget or we don't even want to talk about it because that takes an extra step, an extra effort. There's something else that goes on. And 
And sometimes we don't like it that we've got somebody to raise their hand on a certain day or fill out a pledge card or walk the aisle or whatever, whatever it is, which we love and we think is important. We're not downplaying that. But if that person then doesn't want to become baptized, then that throws us into a theological problem, let alone the last part of the Great Commission, which is to, to teach them all that I commanded you. And that just seems overwhelming to so many people. So why don't we do it? I think because it takes work and because we have to be committed to the holistic process. But why do we keep both words? Because we do need to go. And sometimes discipleship is only we stay and we don't go. But we also use the disciple making because we do have to stay and we do have to develop. So, yeah, that's why those words are together. And I think that's part of our problem is that we don't follow the Great Commission in all that it tells us. Yeah, that's good. And that's a, you know, this is something that, you know, all three of you have pointed out the fact that this is all part of the Great Commission and everything. But, you know, there still seems to be, you know, the term that, you know, Greg, we use all the time is the disconnects. But even outside of just the disconnects we normally talk about as far as street to street to sanctuary or sanctuary, you know, to the altar, all that kind of stuff. I think we need there's there's another disconnect as far as within our churches and it this probably is a little bit more depending on what, you know, what part of Christian, you know, Christianity you are in as far as the, you know, the Calvinism, the Arminianism, all that kind of stuff. But what would you, how would you respond to somebody who looks at Ephesians 4 and says, you know, God calls some people to shepherd or disciple and then he calls some people to evangelize. So I'm not responsible to do both. How do we kind of navigate that sort of stuff? And I'll, I'll open this up to Greg. You can start since we did you last last time. Um, you know, how do we respond to people who are trying to divide these two up because of the fact that they're saying that they're only gifted in one area? Well, I think it's a great question because what you're trying to do is interpret scripture by scripture. And so I think it, this is a, sometimes a question that is raised. And I would, I would liken it or make it akin to, uh, well, I have, I have the, the fruit of the spirit that is self-control or whatever. That doesn't mean I'm not responsible to do the other ones either. Uh, I may be more gifted in this area. And it may be where my major focus should be, but it doesn't mean that I shouldn't encourage all of it and certainly we sh we should partner together in these areas so i think that that the evangelist if when the evangelist gets to heaven and and, and god said why didn't you go and make disciples and they said well that wasn't my job you gifted me as an evangelist i don't know that that's going to wash real well uh or why didn't you ever lead anybody to Jesus? Well, I was just supposed to disciple them. I was, no, I, 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 I think there can be focus um, and kind of a, a, as we say, our sweet spot. But we do need to know that it's holistic and that we're responsible for all of it. That's how I'd start the conversation, Andrew. Eric, Roger, anything to add? Yeah. I <laughs> when Paul said that God has given gifted people to the church, and he, he specifically names the evangelist and the apostle and the prophet, um, you have to go one verse further, and it says that he gave those gifted men to the church that they might equip the saint to do the work of the ministry. And so there's this replication of not just the information in, in Scripture, but the application of what's in Scripture. And so certainly there are leaders in the church, and God has given specific leaders for the sake of the advancement of the kingdom, but it's the body of Christ working in concert that accomplishes the goal. And so, you know, maybe you take that verse and add to it 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, where Paul said that the things that uh, 
you have taught me, teach others who will be faithful to teach others also. And you see four generations of believers being instructed and passing on instruction. Yeah, pardon me for taking longer than maybe I should, but this is one of the things that happens in sports ministry is we'll have leagues for children. And we think because I'm the director of the sports ministry, it's my responsibility to try and evangelize everybody in that league. And the answer is no. Who's the small group leader? It's the coach. So you as the director should be investing yourself in the coaches. You're discipling them in order that they then might disciple the players. And then you begin to see that 2 Timothy 2, 2 become into play. Yeah, I think I would just add, I mean, imagine if, if Jesus was like, I'm sorry, um, my job is just to evangelize and, and that's it. Um, or if, if Paul would have just said, oh, well, my job is just to disciple. I mean, certainly that wasn't the case in scripture at all. And I think you see that in just the, the mentality, the, the consumeristic mentality of the church. Um, it's just become a, well, I'm sorry, that's not for me. When um, I would see um, Matthew 28 as a clear call uh, to all believers um, for the church um, to go and make disciples. And uh, just the, the challenge for um, individuals in the church to realize that that's my call uh, is to go and make disciples. And he doesn't qualify that and say, well, if you've been in the church for five years and you've completed all of these prerequisite classes, um, if you're age 52 um, or older, um, he doesn't make any of those distinctions. Um, he just tells them to go and make disciples. And um, I, I, I just have really seen, at least here where we are, just the consumeristic mentality that it's so easy to push it off onto somebody else instead of owning that um, individual responsibility to do that. I think what you said is, is so very positive because uh, if we really believe that the Holy Spirit empowers people, if we really believe the power of the scripture and a very clear command, Eric, I think you, you, you nailed it there. It's a very clear command from Christ himself before he ascended to be with the Father, before he said, hey, you, you're my followers, and this is meant for all of us. I entrust you to continue this mission. If we believe all that stuff, we know that God has given people everything that they need to, to multiply other followers of Jesus. We, we have to believe that. It isn't just a select few. And then it's our job as ministers, if, if you're in that role, to equip others to believe that and to give them some very tangible tools to know, hey, this is how you do it. So I think that's a great transition. Uh, I would love to kind of hear from you all, uh, maybe some very practical things um, about what you are doing. And if, if you're watching this right now, and if you have a question, if, if you would uh, just go ahead and, and chat that to myself or Andrew, we'll be sure to ask that for you. But for our conversationalists, what have you done um, to make this an overall holistic um, process at your church, in your leagues, to not just be a day's decision, as we say uh, at CSRM, not just a one-time thing where maybe you've got a, a conference or an, an end of season celebration where you have maybe a professional athlete come in or somebody who, who, who does a great job of presenting the gospel and people raise their hand or they fill out a card and so we say, hey, they, they're one to Christ. How do you move from a day's decision to a dedicated disciple in your setting? I'd love to hear about your metrics. Love to hear about a process. Uh, love to hear about what you've seen that works well. And so, Roger, let's, let's start with you. How have you seen churches or how have you yourselves uh, your, yourself move from a focus on a day's decision to a dedicated disciple? Early on, we were very successful in gathering people for the events. And um, this was the first time our church had attempted to do sports ministry. And so there was, uh, if not stated, at least there was an implied pressure that we need to see numbers. Uh, we need to see the, uh, you know, lots of kids in the leagues. We need to see. Uh, lots of adults in your aerobics program or whatever they, you know, their, their term for success was numbers. And um, when we were doing that, 
it was still apparent to myself and the other leaders of the ministry that we really weren't being very successful. And so it was uh, critical for the life of the church and critical for the life of the sports ministry that we develop a philosophy of ministry that people knew why we existed. And so uh, some of you have heard me before use the FEDA principle, F-E-D-A. We really sold that hard in all of our activities so that if somebody came to me and said, well, we want to do this. And my question back to them would be, why would we based on F-E-D-A, F fellowship and friendship? We wanted to penetrate the unbelieving community and we wanted the church to have the opportunity to fellowship together. But we did those two things and the, the, the fellowshipping part of it, I mean, the friendship part of it, that we might evangelize and having evangelized, we might disciple and having disciples, we A, might assimilate. And so that became our mantra all the time, anytime we came into the league. And the second thing that we did was shepherd coach training. We knew, again, and I'm repeating myself here, and I'm sorry for that, but we knew that the coach or the director of an individual program were the people who were going to both disseminate the gospel, but they are also going to be the ones who came alongside those who are responsive to the gospel. And so we trained them on how to disciple. In other words, you can't disciple if you haven't been discipled. Well, you can, but it's easier if you have been discipled. And so the mindset was always, we want to make disciples. And that's where I like Eric's concept of disciple making. That was, it was just the DNA of the ministry. And our people understood it. Our church leaders understood it. And that made a world of difference in seeing fruitfulness in the ministry. I love what you said for for two different reasons, Roger. Number one, it's something that is easily replicated because people can memorize what FEDA stands for. And I put it in the comments. And if you're watching uh, live, this will probably be up on the screen as well. But fellowship, friendship, evangelism, discipleship, and assimilation. Uh, so that's something that that can be transferred to the, the coaches, to those shepherds. And I, I, I love that word too. If we see our coaches as shepherds, if, if we go back to this whole concept, our job is to equip the saints. Well, as a league director, as a sports minister, as a minister in general, if we spend more time with equipping those people with something tangible, like what you just said, it, it, it transfers and, and, and they get it. And it's something that just allows things to uh, continue to move forward uh, in this process, knowing that it does take time. I also love that you said that there's tension with numbers if we're not careful. And that can be our sole focus. If, if we feel pressure, whether it's something that uh, we bring about ourselves, many of us who are on this, uh, this call here or who are watching after the fact are former athletes, we love to perform. We love competition. It's not a bad thing, but when our focus gets tied into numbers, we know that that shifts our focus on something that can be sometimes short term. And this is more of a long term thing. So, Roger, I think you said some really good things there. Eric, I'd love for you to kind of dive in. How, how can we move from a day's decision to a dedicated disciple intentionally? What are some things that you guys are doing to help with that? Um, well, I think first, you, the, the church at large, I think, has to ask the question, what does discipleship look like for all of us? And the, um, at least what I've noticed is a lot of churches, and including ourselves um, for many, many years, it would all be within separate ministries. They would define it completely differently. And every, every ministry is, is supposed to be discipling everyone that's in it. Um, everyone that's serving in it, everyone that's volunteering in it, everyone that's um, being a part of it. Um, so for us, as um, we began to really uh, seek out what does discipleship really look like, um, because we, we didn't feel like we were making them. And if that is our um, primary, if not sole purpose as a church, um, that, that's a problem. <laughs> and um, as we talk with others, other churches that were around and sit at you know, network lunch meetings, be like, hey, what does discipleship look like for you? Um, most people... Well, you don't look down, you know, hoping that they wouldn't have to answer the question. And we kind of felt the same way. 
Um, so that started us on a journey. And so we found um, a lot of help um, with looking at uh, what Robbie Gallaty and uh, replicate.org is doing. Um, and they, um, they've simply outlined some things that I think are just, they're just biblical. It's not a, here's a program that uh, you can do that you can aspire to. Here's a system that you can do. It's not any of that. Um, it's really just helping people take steps in the spiritual disciplines so that they can get into God's word, uh, memorize God's word, journal God's word. Um, and it's, 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 it's the scripture through the powerment of the Holy Spirit that is what changes us. Um, it's not a program that we do. Um, it, is, it is God's word that does that in the spirit. And if we're not engaging uh, those things as far as a spiritual discipline, as we know, a physical uh, training is of some value, but training in godliness is of value in all things. And for us, as we began to um, implement a more of a pathway and less of a program, um, our people began to see, okay, um, this is for me. And um, I'm supposed to be um, making disciples and be about disciple making and uh, what that looks like. And for us, um, the win, I'm not sure if this was in your question or not, but the, um, the big win for us um, isn't when um, someone um, gets saved, although certainly um, that's an exciting A win. Um, it's not when they come to church. It's not when they come to um, life group. And those are all small wins. But the, the win, what uh, we're really looking for at the end of the day is the replication or the multiplication at the end where you now have um, a disciple making disciples. And that idea, I think, has just really revolutionized things for us. And just seeing the growth um, has really been incredible um, just over the last uh, few years of our journey. Now, Eric, that that's a interesting thing. You know, when you, you talk about you, you finally have identified what your success is going to be, you know, measured in. Is this something where it it came about as a church culture thing, as far as your church suddenly realizing, Hey, this is our goal. Was this something that was more staff led as far as, you know, we need to be focused on this. You know, how, how is it communicated to the, the congregation as far as this is really what, what we are looking for within our, our ministries. Um, for us, it started with our elders were on that journey to figure out what in the world it really looked like and um, spending much time in prayer trying to find every resource that we could honestly being um, significantly disappointed in what we found <laughs> and um, as as we kind of discovered this idea we're like is it really that simple I mean certainly it's got to be much more complicated than this right um, so but we're like man we think this model this idea is really what God had set out from the beginning so we're like, all right, let's just try it. So we, we put together a couple of pilot groups with, we, with some people we knew that would be interested and take it seriously. And, you know, they're three months in and they're like, man, we think this is really good. Uh, which they're six months in, like th we totally have to do this. We're like, okay, we just want to see what it's like <laughs> after nine and 12 months of a year. Are, are you still going to be saying those same things? And are those people going to be looking um, to multiply? And God just blessed that um, effort um, by those original pilot groups. And we began to share and allow those people to share with our church of here, here's where we're at. Here's the change that's happened. Here's how we've done it. And um, people responded incredibly well. Um, of course, there were always some skeptics and you know, people were, no, I don't, I'm not remotely interested in that. Or um, I, I just want to be a pew sitter um, type of thing. But um, even a lot of the skeptics over the last few years have been like, man, I, 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 I kind of want to be in a group too. <laughs> um, and, you know, we, we strive our best um, to keep it as organic as possible. And um, we don't do matchmaking, at least as much as possible. We want people that are multiplying these groups um, to go to God and to pray and say, who, who is it that you want me to, to invite to be in my next D group? And we expect those people to go and invite them. Um, and um, it's just been, it's been remarkable to see what God. 
Yeah, it's one of the things that I'm, I'm working with a couple of churches as to that question of what are churches doing. And I know that this is when I was uh, 15 years as, as a local church sports rec and fitness minister. One of the key things is the integration of the ministries, this, this pathway rather than a program. And I'll give you a couple of quick examples of that. If you have a children's basketball league or soccer league, so these are grade school type of kids, have, if the church has a staff person that is doing that, and what are they typically doing? They're doing Sunday school classes. They might be doing some midweek kind of anything from Awana to Bible studies to, I mean, you name it, choirs and, and uh, vacation Bible schools. To have that staff person involved in the sports league as doing the devotions, as a coach, what have you. Have the coaches in your leagues become the Sunday school teachers for that same age group. Same thing, go to youth, go to young adult, go to whatever. Have the staff of the church, the senior lead pastor, be involved in whatever. And if they're uh, young enough and athletic enough, let them play in the soccer league or the softball league or the basketball league. And if, if they've reached a certain age and they and they want to join the golf league or something that's more physically where they're at, but to have the integration of the ministries is a big part of that. And part of that starts with we we do need to consider what that person who is far from Jesus and far from the church, what their recreational pursuits are, but we start with the pew sitter and what are their leisure pursuits? Do they do this? Do they do that? Are they bicyclers? Maybe you need to do a bicycle club or event. Are they bird watchers? You know, it doesn't have to be sport. It can be lots of things, but what are the leisure pursuits of the person who sits in the pew on a Lord's Day morning and their peer group to come and join them in this other thing so that it is a pathway, not a program. And this is one of the main things that churches are, that are successful are doing is that they start with the leisure pursuits of their people they integrate their ministries so that it is more touches per week, more overall ability to move people down the road. And I, I think that this is something that is it, it, it's too often at silos. The sports people, they're doing their thing, and the CE people are doing their thing, and the men's ministry is doing their thing. And to bring it together and to have those leaders integrated as well. So that means sports ministers, yes, you need to teach a science school class. Yes, you need to get involved in the worship experience, the traditional worship experience. We understand we can worship in sport, but the traditional worship service. So there's a lot that can happen if we integrate. Yeah, that's good. And one other thing that you know you brought up there, even though you didn't use the term, we, we've talked about the past few few uh, talks. Um, the the episode I just released this morning from Ministry Misfits with David Waddell, we talked about it in there also of the fact that a key piece to evangelistic disciple making needs to be intergenerational ministry as well. Um, so, Eric, we'll we'll start with you again. How how have you seen intergenerational ministry taking place there within your church? You know, is it something that is happening regularly? Is it happening organically, or is this something that you guys are are still working on or, or have had to work on? Um, I think when it comes to um, just the, the process and pathway of discipleship, when it comes to um, D groups um, for us, um, the, the intergenerational pieces happened, um, I think mostly. So, um, for instance, the, my, the previous group that I was involved in, um, there was um, a gentleman that was 73. Um, there was um, someone that uh, was in their mid four, two in their mid 40s, one in their 50s, one in their 30s. Um, that are going on right now, everyone from um, single women that are 21 
um, all the way up through uh, women that are about 60, um, single or married. Right now, I'm doing a, a group that just started last night, which I'm super excited about with some high school guys that um, are, are ready to, to take this step. So I think it's happening. And uh, the, the challenge that we're having just as a church um, is just making sure that everyone knows everyone, because when they don't, it's because, again, we don't match make. <laughs> they have to know other people. Um for God to be like, Hey, I want you to invite, um, Sarah or Joe or, uh, Nathan. Um, they, they've actually got to know that that person exists, um, to be able to invite them. So just making sure that that cross pollinization is, is happening. But for us, primarily people are, um, they're, they're forming their D groups out of their life group. And we kind of view that as just part of the pathway, uh, people they've already developed community with. So Roger, what about, you know, in your years of ministry and, you know, as you've gone through the different stages in your own life, how, how have you either incorporated the intergenerational side or are you, are you doing it now? Yeah, it, it was a seminal moment for our ministry when we realized as Eric had pointed out, and, and I think Dan mentioned it too, is the segregation of ministries in the church, you know, and, don't don't tread in my turf. And uh, so I just took the time to go into every ministry office in our church and sit down and say, what can we do together to make you more effective in reaching your constituent? And uh, that began to open the doors for the intergenerational. Um, with children's ministry, as, as Greg pointed out, if they were working through a particular series, the devotions that they would be doing midweek in their sports ministry would complement what they were doing in their Sunday school class. Um, the, where the golf tournaments originally started for men, they became father-son or father-daughter tournaments. Same thing with tennis. It was intergenerational. We didn't try and impose that, but where it was comfortable, we would go ahead and try and, and work into the multi-generational aspect of things. But again, I think it was the cooperation and then they stopped seeing sports ministry as a competitor. And we've talked about this before. When you just, when you start sports ministry in the church, you're not always well received because you're now going to become a competitor for that same budget. You're going to be a competitor for facilities. And if, if you don't, sit down with those people and begin to work with them, then there's always going to be this conflict, my ministry against your ministry. We, we happen to have a, a worship pastor who loves sports. So it was easy to sit down with him when they were doing the Christmas or the Easter musical dramas to schedule. It seems like a little thing, but to schedule their practices for those children that didn't compete with the practices for the youth leagues. Uh, because then we were going to force children to choose. Am I going to be in the Christmas musical or am I going to be on the basketball team? And so cooperation and uh, a, a concerted effort to work together were the things that we tried to uh, accomplish. You know, I think this whole process, um, a great exercise to develop and even um, to think through your theology as to why the church matters, why um, sports ministry matters and all these efforts, because everything you guys are saying is just, it's, it's huge. And I think it's something we all have to work through. All, all that can be found in a great resource that I want to turn it over to, to Greg to, to mention here. And uh, it's one of our, it's one of our first books that, that CSRM has produced and it's uh, uh, sports outreach fundamentals. And there's an exercise in there to work through, maybe with your leadership team. I think it's in chapter one. And Greg, you'll have to um, remind us of that. But it's basically talking through the the metrics and and why all this matters. But but Greg, I I would even say, uh, explain to us some of the the ologies why we should have a good um, a good viewpoint of the church and sports ministry and why all this matters. Uh, 
kind of walk us through some of the things that are, that are very foundational to even beginning this whole process here as, uh, as, as you've referenced some of those things in, in that book there. Well, thank you, Dan. And I, I do think it boils down to what we've come to call the ologies. Yeah. Uh, CSRM calls them the sports outreach ologies. And there's a few of them. And one of them that you're, that you're talking about now is what we call soteriology. It comes from the Greek word soter, meaning salvation or savior. And so I think that a lot of churches, if not the church universal itself, struggles with what's, what should be our success statistic. What should we say and say when we've been successful, what, what have we done? What have we seen? And, and I, I, I'll tell you the story that, that I was at a sports ministry conference and there was a very, very prominent um, college football coach there, one of the winningest of all time. And he talked about a time one of his players passed away and they had a session with the whole team. And he talked to his whole team about that they needed to get saved. And they went back into the office and his assistant coach said to him, I don't know what you mean by that. What, what, what is it? And he says, and I got my assistant coach saved. Well, the guy sitting next to me leaned over to me and I didn't know. him. And he said, I'll bet you that assistant coach is really surprised by that statement. And I said, why is that? He says, well, if he's saved, so is uh, Adolf Hitler and everybody else. And, and, and so did he that day say to the coach because he wanted to keep his job? Yeah, okay, I believe that. Or pray to prayer with him or whatever. It was obvious from the guy who I never knew sitting beside me that that guy had, he had never come to Christ. And so what does getting saved actually mean? And I think that, that that's where we have to wrestle in our churches. And then once we establish what that means, then we can go about organ approach our ministry. Because if our soteriology is, all you got to do is get somebody to raise their hand one day, and that's all you need to do, then everything is going to be geared programmatically towards that but if they're saying this is important but that's the starting point not the ending point and we need to go to full spiritual maturity then they program around that so that that process does take place and so to kind of wrap this up I, i'm i'm saying that are are we sure in our local church, what success actually means, what's our success statistic. And then from there, we'll grow this program and develop this program. Now I'm gonna give you this in summary. We typically have two methodologies. One of them is what we call the mega model methodology. And the mega model is if you have a mega event, it's already been mentioned, you get a great big platform speaker that comes in and, and verbally makes a, a, a verbal proclamation. So it, it's a platform proclamation. If it and the other one is a mass media where it may not be live, but through some sort of written or video or, you know, whatever form that we get that same message out. It's a verbal proclamation. But the other one is what we call the 3R model. And the 3R model is repetitive, happens maybe every day, at least every week. I'd say at least every month, preferably every week. But it's repetitive. So people come back time and time again. And it's based on relationships. So it's relational. First R is repetitive. The second one is relational. It allows people to build those relationships that Eric was talking about over and over and over again. And then it's got to be redemptive in its focus to redeem them to Jesus. So the three R approach. Now, those two can be used together. You can be doing weekly, 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 repetitive, relational, redemptive. And then 
and have dominate, or it may kick something off. They work best in tandem. It's not that one's right and one's wrong. But I do think that this leads us then in churches. How do we organize based around what we believe? And what we believe leads to the organization, which then leads to what we do, the methodology or the model. And I think that's just crucial for any church. What do you believe getting somebody saved means? What do you believe making a dedicated disciple actually means? And before I have the others weigh in on this, I, I just... I can't encourage everyone enough to um, to recognize if, if you are a sports minister, you have a chance yet again to lead the way for your congregation. Uh, meet with your senior pastor, uh, meet with your elders, talk through like, okay, what, what do we really believe about salvation? Because a lot of times we, we assume everybody knows, and sometimes we just have to have that, that conversation. And so work through exercises like that. Um, and hopefully it's done in a very non-threatening way. You can just, you know, come come to your senior pastor, come to your board of elders. Hey, have we thought this through? Uh, do we all understand what that what that win is when it comes to salvation? And then from there, what it, when it comes to being someone who's a dedicated disciple, and we have to have those conversations because uh, if we're going to be effective in ministry, we have to have some measuring points. And so uh, I already mentioned uh, sports outreach fundamentals has, has a good exercise. Greg just kind of walked through that. I, I, I think it's a good thing for us to talk through these things, realizing it takes a long time. And, um, one of the things that Bill mentioned, who's on this call here, he sent me a, a message. Uh, he says, in order for us to, to make disciples, we ourselves have to know him. <laughs> and so I, I think it's so important that, that we recognize, hey, when was that moment in time when I gave my life to, to Christ and there was no turning back and I knew for sure that was that moment? And then am I spending the rest of my days growing in him? And so we can't encourage you enough, sports minister, be in God's word, uh, spend time in, in prayer, because in order to help others to know him, we have to know him as well. And so I want to open the, the floor back up, uh, Eric or Roger, when you hear of this concept of ology is like Greg was talking about, um, tell us your, your process, tell us your journey, tell us about your, your church's journey. Like what, what does that look like for you, for your church to clearly define, Hey, this is when someone came to Christ and because they came to Christ by what we can know, we took them on this journey. Tell us your journey with, with the ologies, as, as Greg mentioned there. I'll yield to Eric. Um, I, I, I think for us, thanks, Roger. Um, the, um, we're, um, we're not huge fans of um, numeric metrics, um, to be honest. Um, and part of that might be a... Um, kind of the pendulum swinging to the church that maybe we used to be in our earlier years. Um, you know, we were that growing church, a rapidly growing church. We were probably one of the um, most rapidly growing churches in um, the U S at some point. And um, as God began to reveal um, just sin in, in our own lives and God began to reveal the fact that um what I would say is we as men had built this church. And so we were really good. Um, somehow we became really good at attracting um, disgruntled church people from other churches. And <clears throat> we thought we were awesome until we weren't. <laughs> and as God took us on this journey um, to disassemble us, to rebuild us um, and take us back to his mission of making disciples, the, um, the idea of, of metrics is, is one that we're probably a little bit more on the side of not measuring as much um, in, in part because we've, we've just um, swung away from measuring everything and success is all about these numbers. So the organic piece of it all for us is, is a big deal. And when we see the disciples making um, disciple makers, that um, is where we get really um, jazzed up. So even my high school guys last night, it was our first meeting. And one of the things that we're asking them to commit to um, is to pray about the possibility of leading a group of other guys. 
And they're like, really? I mean, you, you want us to do that? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that some of, if you are I'm a follower of Christ, and, and clearly this group of guys, they are, that um, I think he's enabled you to do that. Um, is that maybe next year? Well, maybe not. Um, but um, you're not going to be leading a, a, a 75-year-old man um, in, a, in a D group um, type of scenario. But I'm, I'm pretty confident there are some other guys that are your peers that are younger than you that um, you could be doing that with um, or um, getting back into another D group um, so that you're continuing to grow, continuing to practice those spiritual disciplines. Because if we're honest, um, most of us aren't going to practice the spiritual disciplines unless somebody else knows that we're not. And there, there's an accountability um, that comes with it that's incredibly positive for us in that kind of group setting. So, I mean, as Greg pointed out, I think there are a lot of people that um, call themselves Christians. Um, of course, we can't judge their hearts. Um, but um, they, they probably aren't. Uh, they might belong to a church. They might be a member of a church. They might go to church every week. They might have raised their hand. They might have said a prayer. They might have whatever. And as you look at um, what a, a follower of Christ looks like in Scripture, um, there's nothing of their life that looks like that. And there was a part of, of my story that I had to look at myself and be like, mm, I don't think so. And so it's just surrendering control of my life. Um, to Jesus at that point, it was clearly different. So, and I, and I think that's in part um, the, the church or churches have perpetuated that idea that um, somehow um, salvation is supposed to be um, easy and cheap. And um, certainly um, it's free. I don't think there's any, I don't believe in workspace salvation or anything of the sort, but we, we've got this idea that, Oh, if, 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 if you just believe these things um, and then go on doing whatever you want to do the rest of your life, um, you're in. And uh, what we've sold is fire insurance. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't sold Jesus to people. And um, so as we look at sports ministry and, and anything um, that's an impacting the community, we strive to look at those things as on ramps to the pathway. Um, I'm probably more of a fan of, I don't, I don't know that it's realistic to expect sports ministry or children's ministry or youth ministry or worship ministry to become the end all um, and do a full discipleship process with every individual. I'm, I'm not sure that that's fair. Although I think that should be our goal as a church at large. Um, sports ministry is an incredible way um, to impact the community, to build on ramps, to build relationships, to share the gospel um, so that so we see those people um, evangelized, uh, one to Christ, and um, they begin at that point to keep working their way down the pathway and eventually connect in community uh, where they're beginning to grow. Uh, they have some um, measure of, of commitment and accountability, but eventually those people are ready to commit um, to a, a life of spiritual discipline and um, take things a little bit deeper. And then you begin to see this multiplication, this replication where they're changing the world. They're out there sharing the gospel too. So for us, the, um, and I've got more to tell you about the whole facility thing, Dan, but <laughs> it's been interesting. But the um, looking at um, sports ministry in our community as being an on-ramp to the, not to come to church, because um, that's not our goal. Um, to fill the seats, um, but an on-ramp um, to the discipleship pathway, uh, because that's what we want to be about. I, I think that's beautifully said. And I think that the challenge for all of us is um, going back to salvation and metrics. And again, no matter your, your theology, I think sitting around with a group of leaders and saying, okay, as we search the, the scriptures, you know, what, what does it mean for someone to be saved? And because they are saved, what fruit should we see? And so I think, again, just the sports minister has a great opportunity because you're probably going to rub shoulders more with non-Christians who are going to come to your building in a lot of uh, cases or come, come to your camp. And so you have a golden opportunity to come to your leadership and say, hey, we've got these people. What does this look like? And if, if they come to Christ and we, we find in the scriptures, this is what this, this means, now, how can we take them on this, this journey, this pathway 
um, as, as, as you said there, Eric, I think that's, that's all fantastic. And I love the idea um, of, of ministries and programs breaking down silos and recognizing, hey, these are all on-ramps to what our entire church is all about. Our entire church is about evangelistic disciple-making. So I love what you just described there. Roger, anything to, to add to what Eric just shared? Yeah, the, the, the church where I started in sports ministry, they segmented the process. They had an evangelism pastor and they had a discipleship pastor. So I learned what not to do in my first position. But, but um, the reality is when you have people congregated for, for recreation or for sports, there's only so much you could do. This is not a preaching opportunity. This is an opportunity to live your faith before people so that they see the authenticity of Christ and those who lead the program. And they learn from that. You know, the old expression, more is caught than taught. And so in our youth leagues and in our adult leagues, the coaches, the shepherd coach became the critical piece of the puzzle. And we began the devotionals. We would talk about the value of prayer, the value of scripture, the value of uh, being uh, congregated on a Sunday. So we were taking basic discipleship principles and incorporating it into the devotions that the, the coaches were doing. Uh, Eric is, is right on in, in that small groups are critical to discipleship genuinely taking place. But again, you already have people congregated in sports or recreation over a common affinity. Uh, how much easier is it to ask a guy to go for a cup of coffee or to go have lunch or whatever, because you already have a relationship through the sporting or recreational activity. Uh, when I started, there was a man by the name of Chris Adsit, worked for the Fellowship of Christian Athletes for a while. He, had, he wrote a book called Disciple Making, and he was kind of the pioneer for me in understanding some of those principles. And I don't know what Chris is doing, but if you can access any of his materials, even though they may be old materials, they're, they're excellent. Uh, Eric talked again about accountability. Um, I'm not sure about women, but I am sure about men. We don't grow without accountability. We are not disciplined enough. We'll get too busy doing other things or too busy having fun. And so that's where the small group accountability comes in. And so that someone's faith, while in the infancy, can be nurtured and can be fed and, and you can grow them. And then when you see them take on responsibility, one of the things we did, we wanted an assistant coach for every coach and the assistant coach was a baby believer. You know, someone who said, yeah, I raised my hand. I made a profession of faith, but we put them right alongside the other coach so that they could see modeled what it meant to be a shepherd coach. And, uh, that was just our way of trying to contribute to this person's spiritual growth. Dan, if I could jump in on both of these uh, comments from, from Eric and Roger, they're both indicating that there's something that, that is necessary, needed, helpful, and that we can provide in some ways very uniquely in the sports outreach area. And it's been it's been bandied around since the Second War with Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and he called it cheap grace. And and sometimes I think what we are we're guilty of within the Christian world is that we want to charm rather than convict the non-believer. We want to coddle rather than convert the non-believer. And so we try to. We, we try to do things very nice and say the nice things and, and make it all sound really good. And I'm thinking that what we really have an opportunity to do in the sports outreach in the local church is to do something that's very hard to do in any other part of the church. And that is that we get the disciple making process started before the person actually has come to personal faith in Christ. So what I mean by that, or how to 
that's the fundamentals of sports outreach. The fifth chapter talks about the five B's of sports ministry. The first B is to belong. Before they ever come to faith, before they ever believe, they belong and are in this community. And as, as Roger uh, has said, you know, these guys come in and, and you take them for a cup of coffee afterwards. That's where they start to ask the questions. What did, what did the speaker tonight mean by that? And the speaker was a guy who gave a five-minute devotion at the end of the basketball game. And, and that belonging enables the gospel to be seen, observed, and felt before it's ever heard verbally. And then they can make those connections. And this discipleship starts by this testimony. All of the sports, when it's at its best, in my opinion, is when the sports outreach devotionals are not necessarily theological, you know, foundations. They're a testimony. This is what I was like before Jesus. This is how I came to Jesus. And this is what I'm like since Jesus. I had a problem with my language. I had a problem with my temper. I had a problem in my marriage. I had a problem. This is what I was. This is how Jesus got a hold of me. And this is the result. And that and that testimony base of giving the gospel verbally platform proclamation that affirms all that has been expressed. And so they can come to believe after having observed it, after belonging. And then you go on to baptism, behavior change, and becoming that disciple. I mean, those five Ds are very much there. And so I, I really think we have to recognize the cheap grace because we're trying to coddle rather than convert, or we're trying to charm rather than convince. And uh, it starts, I think, right in those belonging stage before somebody's ever come to Christ. Greg, you mentioned a great practical resource, the, the five Bs. I put a link there in our description. I'm sure Andrew will bring this up in our recording as well. It's a big part of what we teach at CSRM. Another just very practical way uh, to think this through. And Greg, I love what you said. This actually begins uh, early on, just, just with our testimony. You know, um, when Jesus had his encounter with Nicodemus, he says, you must be born again. And so this whole process a lot of times when people, when, when they come to Christ, they are infants, that the, their behavior isn't there yet. And that's why this whole process of evangelism and disciple making, they, they go hand in hand so that we can see someone grow from that infant in Christ to something that Eric has mentioned several different times, somebody who is reproducing other followers of Christ. It is hard to believe, friends, but we are almost out of time. And I think we could talk about this forever. I can tell you that CSRM, we are committed to this whole process of helping sports ministers, helping churches. If, if we can ever be of service to you, would you reach out to us through our website? And uh, we'd love to talk about uh, coaching, um, just helping you think through all this, because we know that this is a key component to churches being successful and leveraging their sports ministries to help them with that. And so if we can help and be of, of service, uh, we've mentioned a couple of resources and books, uh, please do reach out to us. I know this was a big topic of conversation at the most recent REACH gathering, and I'm sure it will continue to be because this is where a lot of churches are just struggling. And so, uh, um, you know, if, if, if we can help with that, we would love to do just that. So I'm going to ask. Can I insert one thing? Yes, sir. Yep. You know, I, I think some people listening to this might be intimidated, um, just like some people are intimidated about sharing the gospel. They're equally intimidated about taking on the role of being a disciple maker. I think we need to remember that sandwiched between go into all the world and make disciples. Verse 18, Jesus said that all authority in heaven and earth was his. And then he closes that by saying, and I will be with you to the end of the age. So as we attempt to evangelize or disciple, we go with the power and the presence of Christ. We can do it. Man, that's, uh, those are great words. In fact, I was going to ask you guys to share some parting words. And uh, that's, a, that's a fantastic reminder. Uh, he is with us. And he sent the Holy Spirit to live in and through us. And 
Uh, that is who empowers us. That coupled with the word of God. Um, yeah, we don't feel worthy at times. Sometimes we don't know what to say or, or what to do. Sometimes there's some very difficult circumstances and uh, tough people to, to crack when it comes to this because of what they're going through. Um, but Roger, to your point, God is with us. So I appreciate uh, those closing words. Eric or Greg, anything to add to that as we uh, round third and head home here? I would just encourage people that um, you might be feeling like your church is um, not really interested in, in asking some of the tough questions. Um, I, I would just encourage you to, to keep on that process. That I think God is doing something clearly in his church, um, not just in the U.S., but across the globe. And um, I think he is readying us um, as, um, as his church, as his people to go back to to return to this mission of making disciples. So it is, it is worth it. Uh, If you're a church staff and you're thinking, man, um, that might just blow everything up. Uh, Well, praise God (laughs) that it does um, allow God to do what he's going to do for his cause and his glory. And um, the journey, the journey is worth it. Absolutely. I think my final uh, thoughts would be that, I know that there has been a move over the last couple of decades to what, what I call count conversions. How many raised hands did you get? And I would encourage people to not disparage that, but to use that as one of their metrics, but that the ultimate metric is rather than counting conversions to really labor long to make dedicated disciples and that's scary to our para ministry world it's scary to our sports ministry world because our numbers will go down our numbers will go down but the kingdom the church of god will expand if we go about making disciples and doing everything we need to do for that so i i would i would encourage everyone to be willing to do the hard work that this is going to entail because it, it does change the, the whole root of it. Yeah. And that, that labor long concept, Greg, that's just uh, it's good encouragement for sure, because it's not something that, um, you know, we just give five minutes to, you know, uh, once in a while, it's something that just takes the the rest of our ministry, the rest of our lives to make, long-term disciples. So, um, and we didn't get a a lot of time to talk about partnerships too. Uh, I think partnerships with a lot of those parachurch organizations, somebody mentioned FCA earlier, things like that. There are some opportunities for for the local church to partner with people who are doing things a little bit differently than than what we're able to with our sports ministries. And so that's something that, uh, you know, we just encourage you explore that with local organizations, parachurch ministries in particular, uh, as you go about this whole process. So we are out of time, my friends. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, it went fast. Uh, we will continue this conversation at some point. And uh, this recording should, should probably be released a week from today. And so if you're interested in sharing that with people on your teams uh, by next Wednesday, it should be up and live uh, through the social media channels with CSRM. And then our next Tuesday talk uh, because of the holiday, we had to move it around. Let me look up the exact date here. And that is going to be on the, uh, the 16th. Um, so we're going to bump it up a little bit because of Thanksgiving uh, and that week and a lot of people traveling. And what we're going to do on the 16th is we're going to talk uh, very specifically with uh, some people in fitness ministry talking about leveraging New Year's resolutions uh, come January and uh, seeing how that can be a part of our whole discipleship process and things like that. So we're excited to see where that conversation is going to go. Be checking out our social media channels as we get ready to promote that here in the coming weeks. And uh, we will go from there. We will uh, take December off because of the holiday and be back at it in January, uh, continuing our Tuesday talk. So thank you uh, to Eric. Thank you to Roger. Thank you to Greg for being a part of this important conversation. Thank you for those of you who joined us. And we look forward to seeing you again in November. Take care.
Tuesday Talks are a production of CSRM and their video production house, Overwhelming Victory Flicks. Dr. Greg Linville is our executive producer, and Andrew Fouts is the associate producer. To find out more about Tuesday Talks or to join our next discussion live, visit overwhelmingvictory.org backslash Tuesday Talks. To find out more about Cool Spring Baptist Church, visit coolspring.org. And to learn more about CSRM, visit csrm.org.